How many people would say that the two words, space and place, have more or less the same meaning? Can I have a show of hands, please? OK, about, about half. For the purposes of my talk this morning, I'm going to need you all to reimagine space and place as completely separate entities, totally separate things, rather than just using the two words as synonymous with one another. I want you to see a place as a concept directly derived from how we perceive our surroundings as human beings. So a place would be here, the Golbenkian stage, or it could be the fire exit over there. It's a place that we can recognize and define. So for example, uh, a place that I can very fondly recognize and define is uh, Weatherspoons in Canterbury. But now space is a much more abstract concept than place. I want you to visualize it as a very vast component of um, how society is organized. And in imagining this, I want you to exclusively think about how social relations themselves underpin society. So putting on a sociologist's hat, which is half of my degree, half of my degree indeed, so you would think about social inequality, you would think about classism, racism, sexism, transphobia, homophobia, a lot of the forms of structural prejudice that hold people down and become part of the lived experience of the narrative of everyday lives. So at the risk of oversimplifying these very studied topics, I'd like you to see place as the physical and space as simply the social relations underpinning particular places. Now let's have a little more context on the condition of safety the state of being protected from influences that are likely to cause us harm or physical injury. In modern life, we expect a relative degree of um, guaranteed safety in certain areas that we inhabit. So you may go to a nightclub, for example, and you would expect that when you come to the door, you would see security guards helping, helping you through, checking that there's nobody there illegally, and most of all, pre preventing any physical violence from occurring. So your lives and your social life is regulated by an external actor. We can pinpoint a time in academia when a debate began to be had about regulating the safety of students and not just the, um, the, the studious process as such. And the theory that I'm going to talk about today, which is safe space theory, it didn't emerge at universities per se. It emerged as part of activist circles in the feminist movement and in the LGBTQ plus rights movement. And the idea of a safe space was a place away from conventional society where structural forms of prejudice were seen to inhabit. And it was a, it was a site for people who were victims of prejudice to come up with strategies of resistance against such prejudice. Now, Around about the 1980s, educators began to think about including certain tenets of safe space theory into their own teaching routines. And the whole point of this was to protect students from um, forms of discrimination, hate speech, and most importantly, the intimidation um, that might come from that. And it's what's known, um, it's what Joanne Goldtang um, termed structural violence. This isn't subject-object violence, this isn't physical violence, but this is a um, situation created in society where certain people get left behind and certain people, uh, be it because they're gay or because they are a minority, they're left behind and they are, stru and they are structurally um, discriminated against as part of the system. And the point of educators bringing this theory into the classroom was that it was a recognition that to what might be seen as a neutral setting, a very calm setting, say, like we have here now, it was an understanding that people who had faced prejudice, be it sexism, racism, and such, that they may not feel as comfortable expressing themselves or putting themselves on a level playing field as those who hadn't experienced that prejudice. So that was the logic in behind creating classroom as something called an inclusive safe space. Um, Robert Boostrom, the sociologist, um, put this perfectly. It was about attending to the plurality 
of all conscious, consciences without censoring critical thinking. Now, there's been a huge uproar in the media about safe space culture on university campuses. There was a LexisNexis search done, which is a, is a, it's a huge database of newspapers. And the references to safe spaces in the last five years alone have gone up something like times 500. It's being talked about a lot. And although this theory was developed in, say, the 1980s or so, people are only just beginning to talk about it in the public discourse. Now, why would you think that would be so controversial? Why would elevating people who had had different life experiences and different forms of prejudice put in front of them, why would that be a bad thing? Why are people calling us Generation Snowflake for embracing these ideas? And why are the newspapers saying that there is such a threat to freedom of speech because this is being taken on? Now, I was able to deduce something. Um, I should say also this was the topic of my undergraduate dissertation. I was able to deduce very early on in the research process that safe spaces were only ever of interest to the media when there was a censorious angle attached to the articles. So, for example, it would, um, the newspapers might cover what is termed the no platforming of a speaker, where a speaker is invited to um, give a talk at a university and then their invitation is either revoked or they're either banned from coming back from that university. And that could be mandated by a university or a student union. A lot of the coverage also talks about the place of trigger warnings. If you don't know what that is, a trigger warning is a warning on a text or, a, um, or before a class that you might do um, or that you might study that tells survivors of post-traumatic stress disorder that they may be about to encounter things or content in the class that they might want to remove themselves from should they feel it would trigger any of, them, any of the past traumas. I think that as part of all my research, there's nothing really negative about that that you might think on the surface and that you might think that this generation that I think this generation of snowflake stereotype is very, very unfair. Rather than being a generation of very worried, shriveled up millennials, I think that we are a generation who have gone to university and have faced, and, uh, and uh, as a result of that, we've, we've come out and we're facing stagnating wages, for example. We're also um, facing a job market that isn't as um, receptive to graduates as perhaps 10 years ago. And it's quite tough for us, but we get on with it. And I don't think that the snowflake stereotype is particularly fair. But, it imp but an important thing that I want to talk about that I did induce from my research was that there is a question and there is a debate to be had, which I hope to bring to the forefront today, about an ever-growing trend within education to say that some topics should not be broached. And there is, a, there, there is an ever-growing cautiousness on the part of students, on the part of educators, to even talk about difficult topics. And it is, whether it is the, um, as the media reported it, whether it is the banning of sombreros from campuses because they seem to be culturally insensitive, whether it was Edinburgh, Edinburgh University banning the song Blurred Lines by Robin Thicke and T.I. because of its associations um, with rape culture, for example. There, are, there is an ever-growing trend that is undeniable, wh whether you support it or you don't support it, that some ideas and some content or imagery is seen to be not able to be taken up by students. But why? Why would that be? The University of Kent's own, um, I believe she's a lecturer in education here, um, her name's Joanna Williams. She wrote a book called Academic Conformity in an age of, um, sorry, academic censorship in the age of conformity. And she argues that this is a sign of the times, that this is a result of an educational context where it is assumed that universities must have a responsibility to protect students from this controversial or potentially sensitive material. And in a sense, she argues that universities have taken up 
this, this responsibility and this remit to protect people from emotional harm in a similar way to how people with post-traumatic stress disorder, for example, may be protected from triggering material. Now, when I, bring, when I problematize this notion, I'm not suggesting for one moment that people who have been affected by trauma shouldn't seek the treatment and that they shouldn't have the immediate um, resources to deal with what they've been through um, and, as a result, try and be healed from that. But from what I've seen, I've come to the conclusion that I don't think the classroom is perhaps the most appropriate site for this treatment or this approach where we treat a lot of different topics as potential triggers, I don't think that that is conducive to a free marketplace of ideas. Because one, it neglects the idea that people should be treated for any trauma they have in a professional, um, medical, or psychological setting. And it, it comes up with this idea that we end up where these things are being treated by proxy, essentially, in the classroom, rather than by medical professionals. Another issue with this style of, um, in a way, um, leaving out certain topics or not, not, see, not being seen to approach them is that it misunderstands post-traumatic stress disorder as a condition itself. Because it relies on, this, this way of thinking relies on um, an automatic assumption of fragility within survivors of post-traumatic stress disorder. And it assumes that a system of warnings based on certain texts and certain topics will help them. And it also makes the contested assumption that avoidance of these topics will actually help them. When there have been cases, um, I believe a, a psychology professor at Harvard University, his name is uh, Richard McNally, he has pioneered a treatment called prolonged exposure therapy, where a lot of evidence has come to the forefront that in certain individual cases, I'm not talking about um, a one-size-fits-all model here, but in certain individual cases, reimaginings of trauma can actually decrease the, um, the emotional weight and the, um, the harm, the, the psychological harm that it can do to survivors. So automatically, we, we we recognize that this isn't a given in academia, and we recognize that there is a debate to be had about how to deal with difficult material, and we can't have a one-size-fits-all um, policy where we just can't draw the line as to what may be a trigger, may not be a trigger, because it is such an individualized condition that we can't possibly mandate this from the top down. This is something we have to do from the bottom up. Um, we can cast our minds back to the work of John Stuart Mill here as well, who espoused something called the harm principle. And this was a principle in which we talked, um, in which he, he set out a, basically, a rule of thumb for where free speech could be limited. And that was when physical harm or that speech generated violence itself or incited violence. For him, that was the cutoff point of when free speech is allowed and when it is not allowed. I think for a reason he said physical harm and he wrote physical harm and he didn't write emotional forms of harm because again, I think that Mill recognized that it's impossible to draw the line in such a contested debate and as a result, the politicization of certain forms of emotional harm and on university campuses has, has made it a, almost seen as a cause and effect of a um, structurally violent society. So therefore, we've seen such a variety of people being no platform from the universities, be it the feminist writer and speaker, Jermaine Greer from Cardiff University, who is um, generally regarded as a left-wing thinker, to the um, traditional Burkean conservatives like Roger Scruton, who was no who was um, almost no platform from Bristol. So really, what I'm trying to illustrate with these examples is that we have no idea what is going to be offensive to certain people, and we have no idea how to mandate that from a top-down position. So really, 
we need to approach it on a case-by-case -case basis. Something else the media discourse completely missed about Generation Snowflake and that label and that threat is that they don't realize that essentially any threat to freedom of speech that might happen doesn't just ha have to come from universities and it doesn't just have to come from students either. Why haven't we talked much about the fact that it could be coming from the government in the form of something called the prevent duty? The prevent duty is a cross-party strategy to counter extremism and counter radicalization in early year, well, in um, youth, young adulthood, and across the lifespan. But the duty has been handed down to the universities themselves in which when they suspect potential radicalization, certain people espousing certain opinions must be reported and questioned as a result of this. There was a very controversial case at Staffordshire University where a young counter-terrorism postgraduate was reading his book in the library, and the book said something like global terrorism on the front. And then as a result, he was reported to the prevent duty, and he was pulled aside by officials and questioned as to why he was studying this book for his degree. Now, the student was a, um, was a Muslim, and I think that this attempt to create almost a, a UK-wide safe space through the prevent duty, it winds up as cr treating certain people, say Muslims, as to be suspicious of and to be under surveillance, when that goes against the idea of the free marketplace of, of ideas. So, in context, yes, safe spaces when emotional harm and other forms of emotional politics, that all becomes politicized. Yes, you can end up in situations where this is a threat to freedom of speech, because you can end up in situations where a speaker whose views might not be liked, they might not be supported by very many, but you end up in a situation where it might be better to just challenge them rather than stop them from speaking at all. So, in conclusion, I'd like to offer this idea to you. I'd like to say, let's support inclusive safe space. There is absolutely no reason why we cannot have an environment where everybody is put, put up to a level playing field, no matter where they come from, where they were born, what gender they are, whatever. We should support this for everybody and we should have an equal footing where everybody feels comfortable expressing themselves in the classroom. But I think that we need to reform this strategy that we have both with the no platform policy and with the prevent duty. Because learning only really happens when we're actually able to confront ideas and when we're confident enough to put forward such ideas, knowing that we are sure of our facts and knowing that we're sure of our arguments and that we're comfortable having those put under scrutiny. And that's how a free marketplace of ideas and an enriched learning experience occurs. Because the truth is, whether it is far-right politics, whether it is um, um, Islamism or any other what would be classed extreme ideas, we cannot bury these ideas, we cannot stop these ideas by just ignoring them. We need to go to the effort of outsmarting those who we disagree with, and we need to go to the effort of doing that because it only makes those ideas proliferate more insidiously if we don't. I believe Louis Brandeis said this best, and I'm gonna paraphrase him. Sunlight is the best form of disinfectant. Thank you so much.